Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to First Baptist Church of Lloyd. It's so good to see all of you. I'm grateful that this day is the day of the Lord, and we're going to celebrate and do some things together. So excited that you're joining us both online and later on. And so, folks, let's bow our heads. And as we do, remember, we've got a full week of things happening. Uh, the youth group, the adult prayer meeting, the children's groups, all kinds of activities. Stay tuned to your emails and postings about upcoming events. And so let's pray and let's enjoy the day of the Lord. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for all that you do. And we pray that this day, this special day, will be pleased in worship. There are many prayer requests, both that are public and private. We ask that you deal with everyone. You'll heal our land and that you will draw us close this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Well, Keith and Cindy can hear me, so that's good. No? You can't hear me? A little bit more? It needs to go up a little bit? All right. Well, let's do this. Our first song this morning, I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. Are you glad Jesus has lifted you this morning? Is that getting better? Yeah? Okay. All right. Well, let's sing.
I'd normally say, have a seat. But since we're tailgating and having a good time, I'll get started with Colossians 3. It says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things that are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Here's the interesting part that we launch into Colossians today. Last week when it started to rain, I didn't get to feel like I hit it home all the way so I'm going to catch you up as we launch in to the things of God. As Christians, remember, our motives and our focus ought to be our relationship with Jesus. In other words, the reason you do the things you do is because God chose you. He loves you. Now, I want to make mention, if you've experienced true rejection in all these things of life, let it be said to your heart this morning, God wants you. Chose you. He loves you. And doing the things we do for God is because He loves you. Because we've been set apart by God. We're called to be holy. And folks, we've been forgiven by God. And last week, I shared this story, and I want to make sure that it was an interesting thing as I got a little bit of feedback. There was a couple of folks said, I don't know. I don't know if I could have done that. The story was that a man was at a bar, and he's bragging to all his buddies about his Christian wife. And he told them all that if we went home, she'd get up out of bed and fix us dinner without complaining, and she'd be super nice to us, and... All these things, well, the folks at the bar just thought he was bragging and dared him to give it a shot. So he went home and they woke her up out of bed. She got dressed and she fixed them dinner just as nice and as pleasant as if they had planned it from day one. And so one of the guys pulled her aside after the meal and asked her how she could be so kind considering how rude they were how obnoxious they were. And she said, and I quote, when my husband and I were married, we were both sinners. 
And it pleased the Lord to call me out of that dangerous condition. My husband continues in it, and I tremble for his future state. Were he to die as he is, he'd be miserable forever. I think it's my duty to render his present existence as possible, as comfortable as possible. And it was through her testimony and through her life and through the gospel of Jesus, he came to know Christ as his Savior just a few weeks later. Why do we do the things we do? Because God loves you first. And since God loves you first, now it's talk of, time to talk about what we need to do in order to show that great love to the world. So let's pray our heads, pray, and we'll get started. Father, we love you. And we are so thankful for all that you do. We are so thankful for a beautiful time of worship. Thankful for this wonderful weather today. I pray for our community. I pray for those who are sick. I pray for those who are seeking a doctor's care, recovering from a procedure. And we ask as we open your word today, that you will talk to our hearts and change us from the inside out. Jesus, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, Colossians 3 says we're supposed to put on the new man. We're supposed to put on the new man because we're alive in Christ. We must seek the things that are above. And because we died with Christ, we must put off the earthly things, the things that don't last, away from us. And the result is so that we can become like Jesus Christ. The result is that God wants to renew us Daily, God wants you. So here's the character of the new man. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. As Christians, as Christians, we must put on these eight things. And he starts with tender mercies. Would you characterize yourself as somebody who's tender? Now, I don't mean flabby. I got that part down. I'm talking tender in heart. Have you noticed that the longer you've been saved, the more sensitive you have become? See, this is opposite of America. We pride ourselves on the rugged, tough individual, no matter what gender you are. In fact, the truth is, here's what this interesting phrase means. It means from your innermost being. In America, we call it our heart, right? We accept Christ with our heart. I love you with all our heart. But in Greek, it was, I love you with my bowels. Now be honest. Did you ever think you'd have a Baptist preacher stand on a stage and start talking about the innermost? That's funny. Free to laugh. Alright, so here it goes. See, in Greek, they love people with the innermost. Now, in America, we have a phrase for that. I'm trusting my gut. My gut tells me. And so here's the truth of what Paul is saying. You need to be tender from the inside out. From the depth of all that you are. Now let me put a special challenge. If you ever see somebody that is younger on a stage that's not even related to you, if that doesn't move you, it really ought to. I don't care if they're 3 or 13. When they get up there, it always gets me. Especially when it's somebody related to us, right? And so these tender mercies that go through it, as believers, we ought to display... Tender mercy. Not conditional mercy. Well, I'll give them mercy, but they better jump through some hoops. I'll give them mercy. If they scratch my back, then I'll be nice to them. That's not tender mercies. In fact, it's an interesting thought behind it because what happens is Paul says, you need to display tender mercies. You need to put those on, followed with kindness. Followed with kindness. I don't know, do you consider yourself kind? I mean, we've been saved because of God's kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. 
but as a response to Christ's kindness. Have you noticed that some Christians in life, and I'm talking worldwide, are meaner to other Christians than they are to people who don't know Jesus? Nowadays, kindness seems to be lacking in every area. When I turn on the TV or news of any kind, I don't see the politicians being kind to one another. Doesn't it seem that when you look on the news and someone is pitching a fit for having to wear a mask, do they seem kind when they express their feelings? It reminds me that when Jesus caught the woman in adultery, He knelt down and spoke to her. He helped her up. He gave her instruction. But none of His encounter with her could be considered rude or cruel. He dealt with her right where she was at and loved her too much to leave her that way. And the entire time was considered kind. So Paul follows it and says, after tender mercies and kindness, you need to put on humility. Boy, if there's there's something about us in America society, we don't like to be humble. Humble pie is the worst pie there ever is. It's got a taste of bitterness to it. It's got a taste of humbleness to it. And truth is, Paul says, you need to be humble of mind. In the pagan world, they didn't like humility. They liked people that brag. They liked people that spoke about all that they had done, what they had done well, well, how they were the only ones capable of doing it. Maybe you work with somebody like that. Maybe you live with somebody like that. But let me speak to you. Here's what Paul says. Humility is not thinking poorly of oneself. Humbleness is not, hey, you did a great job, and then somebody bows their head and goes, oh gosh, uh... You know, I'm just kind of doing the best. I know 48 people could have done it better. That's not humble. God made you. He knows what you're capable of in Him. He knows what He wants you to do in Him. And so humbleness is not beating yourself or raking yourself over the coals. Humbleness is acknowledging where you stand with God as He is greater the more you decrease, God is capable of doing everything. And in Him, I can do all things. And so here's the truth of humbleness. The person that is humbleness of mind begins to think of others first. Considers others' feelings and actions. If somebody asks you to wear a mask and you don't want to wear one, I've got good news for you. You don't have to go to that business. If somebody's upset with you on how you're voting, here's the good news. You vote the way that God leads you to vote. It's not an issue that you have to die. Not everything is a war. Tender mercies, kindness, and humility of mind begins to address people in their sinful state and tell them that Jesus is the only way to the Father. That Jesus loves you. I don't know anybody that has ever been convicted of sin and the life and the love of Jesus because a verbal or physical argument started in which the police were called. What kind of testimony is that? Do you lose your mind when God tells you to do something? Because that's what I saw. I see people who are so angry all the time and I begin to think, I wonder when God tells them to do something. Is that how they respond to God? Do they look at the Lord and pitch a big hissy fit into life? Do they stomp their feet? Boy, I don't want to be around the fellow today that cusses God out. But you see what's powerful behind this? is that Jesus is the greatest example of humbleness of mind. He challenged people's faith. And because of that, we're supposed to put the example of Christ in everything we do, everything we say. And after that, we put on meekness. 
Well, isn't it interesting that after being humbleness and mind, the very next thing you want to be is meekness? That's not America. We like to put all the things on display about who we are. You know, I still giggle when I see people's belt buckles that are bigger than my stomach. That's not a joke, by the way. But here's the truth of it, is that meekness is not weakness. We tend to think meekness is this humble disposition that goes, Oh gosh! Oh man! Oh, I'm meek! But listen, here's what the Bible says. Meekness is power under control. Meekness is such a powerful instrument. And here's the truth of it. Warren Wiersbe described it best like this. He said, it's like a wind. It's like medicine. It's like a cult that's been broken. See, here's the truth. Too much wind, it becomes a storm. Too much medicine may kill you. And a cult can easily just lose it and go berserk. But meekness is power under control. And ladies and gentlemen, with the Spirit of God, you have more power than you've ever realized. You don't have to lose your mind. You don't have to lose your sensibilities. You don't have to lose control. Why? Because the Spirit leads you to control. And if you're bothered by something, is there any greater power than going into prayer? Is there anything more powerful than asking the King of all kings, the Creator of heaven and earth, God, this person said something. This person did something. They have this, this, and this. And you lay it out and you say, God, just take control. Just take control. I need you. And I know if you handle it, it will be to my satisfaction. And here's the additional promise from God. You'll like His result. Isn't that awesome? I'll go to an ice cream place and I have to try ten flavors just to choose one that I like. But with God, I like His way better than mine every single time. That's right. Meekness. Boy, in the time of politics, what would it be if we had leaders both at the local and national level who stood on a stage and said, I have prayed and I've asked God to lead me with His wisdom. Wouldn't that be something? And for those of you who are running for election and you're, you're watching this or listening live, may God bless you. May God help you. Because I can tell you this, if you get elected, it's what God wanted. And if you don't get elected, I've got good news. You don't want to be there. Let that be a sense of freedom for you because the power of a holy God loves us on a local and national level. In fact, not every war, as I said, is a war all the time. Remember, in meekness, what is our war against? Ephesians 6.12 says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. The candidate, the team that you're opposing, your work partner, those are not the people that are at war with you. Our war is against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age right now, against spiritual hosts of wickedness of heavenly places. Ladies and gentlemen, I know that the person sitting near you, the person at work, the opposing team, whoever it may be, may be a bigger thorn in your side than you can fathom, but that is not who you're at war against. And here's what this next part. Well, I didn't want to preach this next part. I'll tell you why. Nobody likes to talk about suffering. But see, here's the deal. Many people have the testimony. They said, I've been tender. I've been kind. I've even had a humbleness in my heart. And goodness knows, I tell you what, here's the truth. I've been meek. But I'm tired of this. Because all I feel is like they're taking advantage of me. Here's what Paul says. The very next thing you put on is long-suffering. Some of you have the testimony. You've just been raked over the coals. You feel like a doormat because people have walked all over you. We don't want to discuss suffering. And we definitely don't want to discuss suffering for a long time. But here's what the Bible says. In fact, one of the comments 
that I hear all the time about this section in our life that we're living now, especially about this virus. If I've heard it once, I've heard it five times, ten times just in the last two weeks. I'm not afraid to die. I, I just don't want to suffer. Boy, have I got some news that I don't want to share, but I have to. The Bible says you will. You will suffer. Some of you have suffered with bad relationships, bad financial stuff. Children have robbed you of some joy. Grandchildren are driving you nuts. School, work, whatever it might be. But here's the power of what this is. Paul describes this as literally as somebody who has a long temper. Not a short fuse. Somebody who can deal with a lot. In fact, when a person is long-suffering, he can put up with provoking people and long-term circumstances without retaliating or losing control. Now, don't get me wrong. I know in our human flesh, there are times where we walk out and we just go, I've got to, I've got to take a minute before I lose it. I need a moment before I explode. I've been there. Jenny knows there's this thing that must be like the turkey. I don't know why I'm talking about food this morning. must be hungry. But it's like that turkey thermometer in the oven. It pops when it's done. She can see me and she's like, Hey, do you need to sit down for a minute? I know that's code for you better take a deep breath. Here's the truth of long suffering. You're going to experience one way or another. But through God's grace and His help, you make it through it. Thank you. Amen. you share the testimony of things that have happened to you in the past and you can look back and see God's hand in the thick and the worst of it. I know there's moments when we lose our focus. And we ask God why. God, I know that this is for the best, but I'm having a hard time with this. Are you sure? Are you sure this is what is best for me? In fact, some people have gotten angry in the midst of all of this. But listen, it's okay to be angry at sin. But it's wrong to get angry so quickly at the wrong things for the wrong reasons. I know you've been hurt. I know you've been bothered. I know you've been frustrated. We hate sin. We hate the circumstances that sin have produced, which is disease and death. But we don't hate the person. We don't hate the people. Even when they've done something that has caused us to suffer for a long time. And so here's what Paul says after suffering. Now he calls us to put on forbearance. You know what that is? It's just a fancy way of saying, I'm going to bear you up. I'm going to bear one another. I'm going to put up with you. Nothing says romance like looking at your spouse and going, I love you because I have to. I appreciate you because I have to. But here's what Paul says. Meekness, long-suffering, forbearance, it all goes together. And it really means to hold up, to hold back. Sure, what somebody said to you, you probably have every right to explode on them. Sure, what somebody did, you have every right to let them know where they stand and how they bothered you and how they need to fix their life. Sure, you have every possibility and every chance to look somebody in the eye, tell them how you really feel in such a way that makes them want to jump off a bridge. But the truth is, you should not do that. Paul calls us to put on forbearance, to hold back, to take a beat, to take a moment, to gather yourself. Because here's what happens. When you unload, that's the only thing somebody remembers about you. When you explode, that's all any witness walks away. Too many godly people have expressed themselves in the way they want to and how they want to, when they want to, all because they feel entitled. But as a believer, 
We're supposed to be like the Lord. We're called to be holy, which means that we're set apart. God shows us how forbearing He is to us when He could explode on you at every point, but instead gave us Jesus. God at any point could unload on you and send you and me where we deserve, but instead He gave us tender mercies, kindness. He gave us grace. So as I'm heading towards the end, we've only got a few more. Let this be a challenge. When you leave this place today, before you pronounce judgment, before you post something that lets the world know how you feel, before you go to work tomorrow and speak to those people exactly what they need to hear from your lips, you need to take a moment. You need to take a beat and give your heart to the Lord. You need to say to Him, I know You saved me. And now I know You love me. But if You don't fix me right now, I'm going to explode and say some things I shouldn't say and I'm going to have to apologize for later. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth when you lose it? You just say some things that you go later on and go, man, I shouldn't have done that. Man, I shouldn't have said that. You know, life would be a lot easier if you just kept our mouths in the name of Christ rather than constantly having to call people up and ask for forgiveness. Well, here's the truth. We're supposed to put on forgiveness. In America, it seems like we don't want to forgive. We want to get even. We want to shut businesses down. We want people to feel the anguish of all the things that have bothered us. We want people to know the frustration of our lives. But here's what Paul says. We're supposed to put on forgiveness. See, it's not just enough that a Christian should endure grief and irritations and then we should refuse to retaliate. That's not enough. What it should be is that we put on forgiveness of the people who are causing us the most grief. Boy, isn't that a challenge? Maybe it's the one you live with. Maybe it's the one you work with. Maybe it's your family members that have robbed you of the joy of life. But that's the part we offer forgiveness. Because if you don't, then feelings like we preached about a couple weeks ago, malice, rage, and all that retaliation of anger and bitterness will develop in the heart. And all that does is lead you to other sins. It's Christ-like to forgive. Let me say that again. It's Christ-like to forgive. But we live in a society that says, well, I'll forgive them, but I'll never forget what they do, or what they did, or what they whatever. But is that really forgiveness? Because all you're doing is holding on. How would you like it if God did that to you? I'll forgive Him. But I'm not going to forget what He did. All we want is for God to not remember the things we've done. And what Hebrews says that one of the greatest things that Christ does is when He offers forgiveness, He chooses never to remember your sin ever again. It's a choice that you can make. You have to choose to put on forgiveness. And you choose not to remember. Because when you constantly remember what that person did to you, all that does is cause issues in your stomach and your heart and your head and you tie yourself into knots and your bones and your muscles and everything hurts. You see the key? This is what Paul says. That, that Here's the inspiration of God. Forgiveness does as much for you as it does for the one you forgave. In America, it's hard to ask forgiveness, it seems. Far too often, we let pride get in the way. But here's what happens. Far too often, we let pride get in the way of forgiving someone. I know you've been hurt. I know you've carried scars with you for years. But Jesus 
can free you of all of that. Jesus has set you free from the cross. And so as you put on forgiveness, let me illustrate this thought. Colossians says that if you're raised in Christ, put your things on above. And perhaps today you have the testimony that some of the people who have hurt you worse are the ones who have said, I believe in Jesus. Well, in 1837, a lady by the name of Maria Dyer, her parents were missionaries in China. And both of her parents died very young, so she went to England and lived with her uncle. And in the process of that living, she never forgot about her experience in China and decided to go back to become a missionary. When the process of doing that, she had met a, her husband at that name, Hudson Taylor, the great missionary. And within that promise of things, they began to work, they began to feed people, they began to teach people about Jesus and what He did on the cross and how He defeated death for you and for me and set you free. And so, so many people looked at their work that was producing very little fruit in their eyes and they began to write letters to her, letters to her husband, questioning every move, questioning every thought, wondering if what they were doing was right. And these were all letters from people who professed to know Jesus. You know, it's hard to be second-guessed all the time, isn't it? As parents, you feel it. Grandparents, you feel it. Your kids cause into question all kinds of decisions you're making. But here's the truth of what happened. Maria feeling that all of this pressure, all of these things, she had nine children and only four survived to adulthood and still she got letters. Why are you there? Why are you doing this? What's wrong? Come home. Don't do this. Don't... Anyway, I could go on and on. But here's what her response was. Before she died of cholera, she was 43 years old. This is what she wrote. For me to live was Christ. And to die was gain. I genuinely feel that the best plan, no matter what brings about in our life, to go on with the continued work of Jesus. I know that people may not agree. I know that people are looking out for our interests. But I find it best to let every result of my life be in the Lord's hands. I forgive anybody. She forgave the people who were causing so much grief and so much hurt. You see, when you forgive somebody, it's not because they deserve it. You didn't deserve Jesus' forgiveness. You didn't buy forgiveness. You didn't earn it. And so I know what you feel. Maybe you have given some people so much. You've given them time and energy and money and you've done all these things for these people and you just feel walked over, used and abused. But listen, you don't forgive them because they deserve it. You forgive them because you don't know any other way. Forgiveness does as much for you as it does for the one you forgive. And finally this morning, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you put on love. It's the most important Christian virtue there is. It's the center that ties all the other virtues together. All of the spiritual qualities that Paul mentioned it is true Christian love. If you read 1 Corinthians 13, it's love is the greatest. If you read Galatians 5.22, love is the greatest. It's the first gift that He mentions, followed by joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. Here's the truth. Self-control follows love. We don't like to put on love. We like to put on bitterness and hate. We're wearing the coat of stress. 
I'm wearing the coat of frustration to the point of I want everybody to know how I feel and just the way I feel it. But what if you put on the coat of love? What would that look like every day? You would be somebody that people wanted to be around always. People didn't run from Jesus because they hated Him. They ran from Him because of the conviction of His life. He talked about love of grace and miracles left and right, right? But here's the truth. The most religious leaders of the day rejected Him because He wasn't doing what they wanted. So we leave today putting on love. You know, when love rules in our lives, it unites every spiritual virtue there is. There's beauty in it. There's harmony. And we become mature Christians. Henry Blackaby had a very short quote that I've loved. It said, if there's strongholds in your life, if there's addictions in your life that you've never defeated, the Holy Spirit is still prepared to bring you victory today. Well, if anger, malice, and rage are a part of that, then the Holy Spirit is prepared to put on the coat of love. But will you put it on? So today... It requires Jesus' forgiveness. If you're here today, if you're watching this live or later on, perhaps you need to start at that point of saying, okay, Christ, here it is. I've done things my way. I've tried to live my own life. It's not working. It's now time to ask for forgiveness from you and a brand new fresh start. All it takes is the acknowledgement of saying, okay, Jesus, set me free. I want you. I want your forgiveness and I want you to change my life. And if you're here today, if you're watching this live or taped later on, and you said, well, I'm a believer. I've trusted Christ for a long time. Then how are we doing? Here's your checklist for all of you who like checklists. Do you have all eight? Well, I'm humble, but I'm not suffering. Yeah, sure, I love people, but I'm not going to forget what they did. You see, here's the truth of it. These are the things that every Christian ought to put on every day. So for all those sermons you've heard, ten ways to this and five ways to that, here's just what God's Word says. Put them on. It's not an option. It's what you're being asked to do. And so as we close this morning, as we sing this song, perhaps as a believer what we do this morning is say, okay God, I'm starting with love. I'd like to be a little more tender. I'd like to be more kind. Goodness knows I need to be meek. And I need your help. I need your strength and I need your love. And so would you pray with me this morning as we sing our song and ask God to take over our lives. Father, we love You. And we are indeed thankful for all that You do. And this morning as we spend the moment in time with prayer, asking You, Your Spirit, to change us, for those who don't know You, I'm begging that through this moment, they will ask for Your forgiveness. Ask for a fresh start. But for all who are believers, let this be the challenge of our lives to be more tender, to be more kind, to absolutely love unconditional. Forgive us and forgive others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for watching online and later on. I pray that you have a terrific day and that we show the great virtues of what Christ has done for us. Remember, we've got lots of events coming up when it comes to certain Bible studies and things. Stay tuned for emails and videos and all the other parts that wrap up First Baptist Church of Lloyd. Thank you all. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we are so thankful that you have set us free from sin and death. And so our life today, let it be the example that others need to follow. In your name we pray. Amen. Goodbye, everybody. Take care.